Okay, I'm here today with Patrick Ahern, one of the most storied graduates of our School of Architecture, Syracuse University School of Architecture. Thank and, you, Michael. Um, you know, Patrick, I, I was reading your new book, uh, been poring over it, uh, mm -hmm. Timeless, and um, one of the things that strikes me about the book is when I think back about, because we, we know each other and I know right. your history, but I also... I also know that um, uh, uh, one of the things that you that you really that's revealed in Timeless is the the what many people would think is the com is the conflicted nature of modernism and many of the things that people associate with modernism, the f smooth flow of space, right, lighting, glass, indoor outdoor activity. indoor outdoor living. Right. Um, uh, people often don't associate that with the kind of traditional architecture, adaptive use that you've become very well known for. But I know actually there's a line that runs directly from one to the other. That's, I think that's a fascinating thing about the book and it's certainly part of your own education. Uh, I'm, you know, one of the things that I discovered about you early on is you're the only graduate of the school that I know of who completed a Bachelor of Architecture, <laughs> professional degree, and a master's uh, degree almost at the same time, one right. year later. That's um, right. Could you tell us a little bit about your well, time at the school and, 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 and how, 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 how your education and how, how you went from modernism to being really one of the most important architects and thinkers for uh, in terms of contemporary in terms of contemporary traditional living and contemporary right. traditional architecture? Well. Um, First of all, to answer the question about uh, how I did uh, the Bachelor and Master of Architecture somewhat at the same time, um, there was a little thing going on in the world called the Vietnam War, oh, yeah. and my draft number was 23, so I was very focused to kind of stay in school as long as I could. And by having gone summers and so on uh, in my fifth year, um, I realized that if I started to double up and so on, that I could probably... Uh, move the question along and so I was taking 21 credits a semester and I was uh, taking a, a fifth year design studio and a graduate design studio at the same time and back in the old days they were in two different schools right, right. so I applied to the graduate school independent of still doing the fifth year ah I never knew that okay that's right so that was the little little trick I see and uh, and so I, I did quite well. I worked really hard, and I got an A in in the fifth year studio and an A in the graduate studio. And um, so I got the uh, Bachelor of Architecture cum laude in May of '73, and the Master of Architecture in August of '73. So I completed all of those somewhat simultaneously, uh, and then I still had gotten drafted. That's which is another story. <laughs> And then and then off to Boston. I, I, I right. saw uh, I, I don't know if I saw it in the book or I saw it online uh, a photo of you and a and a beetle yes. loading it up. That's right. Getting ready to take off for Boston, and you ended up working there at two very important uh, firms that were associated with modernism. That's right. One, in fact, associated with the Walter, Walter Gropius, Gropius yes. started the Architects Collaborative. Exactly. So. Um, yeah, I really had a great experience uh, in both firms. One was Benjamin Thompson Associates, who Ben Thompson was one of the original partners in the Architects Collaborative with Gropius, and Gropius was his teacher. Right. So um, I had the benefit of working at, uh, at Ben Thompson's office on some really important projects that have really influenced my career. One was Faneuil Hall Marketplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was really pioneering in terms of urban... Uh, revitalization and really creating uh, a, a retail iconic place that uh, didn't have any parking right so it was impossible really to get financing for the Rouse company which were the developers for the city of Boston the right. city of Boston restored the shells of the buildings the old marketplace and then the Rouse company uh, was the designated developer and it was really Kevin White, the mayor of Boston at the time, that really went to the vault, which was the group of collection of banks in Boston, and said, uh, you need to finance this collectively. Right, right. Uh, because no, no, no one bank would finance a shopping center without any parking. And Faneuil Hall uh, won the 25-year AIA award. Uh, but more importantly, there are over 8 million people visit Faneuil Hall every year. Right. Which is more than Disneyland. Right. 
So it really became something special. But I learned from working on that project, um, and I drew all the little cobblestones before computers. So <laughs> on, on the drawings that I would show the BRA and the Rouse Company, all the animated streetscapes, I hand drew. Wow. And I used to draw really small. I still do. And then we'd blow it up you into wallpaper. Me, you told me about that and one so time. And so we'd create these exactly. huge wallpaper experiences in color. And that's what sold the project. And that's what sold the project. So, and, and again, before computers and things like that, uh, we would do these multimedia slideshows with music, and we'd show the flowers and the, and the push carts and, and the kids running around and the balloons. And then, right. we, then we learned to say, okay, take the 360-day calendar, day and night, all the seasons, and how do you animate a public space? Right. So I really learned that the spaces between the buildings become, and sometimes in this case, more important than the buildings themselves. Right, the right. buildings became the backdrop. And with the garage doors that opened up, we really created in the modern thinking uh, a seamless transition from indoors and outdoors. Right, right. And I also learned uh, about you know creating the spine and the organizational structure and that off the spine things will happen, which again is a modern idiom. And in my houses today, uh, I still use the same philosophy of indoor-outdoor, transitioning as smoothly as you can, uh, creating spines and organization within a house that are really modern forms, but sheathe it in a historical context right. that celebrates the greater good of the context that you're working right, in. Right, right. You also, I mean, you were, you were at those firms for, for a number of years, but in addition to working on projects like Faneuil Hall, you worked on some big scale planning thing. So right. so people looking at your work now, they have no looking idea. at those exquisite houses, would not know that you were a planner as well. So I spent three years working in the Middle East, in yeah. Abu Dhabi, Alain on Cairo, on, uh, for Intercontinental, on hotels, and then I was one of the lead urban designers on a new petrochemical city from scratch on 62 square miles in Jebel, Saudi Arabia. Right. So I had to learn a different culture, right. but a lot of the same thinking of, of sense of place, of scale, of uh, how you organize uh, a community, in that case around the market and the mosque, um, and also dealing with the natural cons considerations there. We had to raise the site 20 meters because of the, the storms, right. and, and we're on a seaport. And we're a petrochemical city, but how to create uh, an identity of its own from scratch. So there were really great lessons that I learned on large-scale planning and urban design that uh, actually carry through into into doing the kinds of things I do today. Well, in fact, your your undergraduate degree at Syracuse was an architecture degree. That's your right. master's was a planning degree. That's right. So really, from the outset, you were set up to work in both these kinds of worlds. That's right. That looking at the, as I, you know, looking at the book, <laughs> looking at your work seems inconsistent, but they're absolutely consistent. That's right. And Syracuse really gave me that, that, uh, that experience. One of the professors that I had at the time uh, in the urban design side of things was uh, George Von Shevin, and he would come up from Philadelphia. He was a planner in Philadelphia, and he would come up one day a week to teach a course on urban design. And I learned more in that one semester from him mm. uh, about scale and sense of place um, than probably any other person I've ever met. And that, that really helped me in a significant way in the thinking on, on Faneuil Hall that right. I felt I really contributed to but then also on the town planning for JaVale. Right, right. And it was really important, right. and Syracuse gave me that. So after, I know after you left those two, well, maybe while you were working at those offices, you started to do some projects practice. on the side. Really early entrepreneurial activity, right? That's right. I mean, you, were, right. you, were, you were striking out on your own, starting to do kind of self I mean, you were doing development as well. That's right. So in, in, uh, in 19, so in 1970, Five, um, Back Bay in Boston was really pretty much abandoned. You couldn't get a mortgage on a building past, say, Berkeley Street, and these were alphabetical streets, mm -hmm. uh, all the way down to Mass Ave and Gloucester. Because buildings were burned up, uh, people were setting them on fire for insurance. Uh, Newbury Street, as it exists today, didn't exist. And so uh, I bought a shell of a building for $29,000 on Marlborough Street. And uh, I sold my car. I sold a lot of things to, to make that happen. <laughs> and uh, 
and we created some of the first early condominiums in the city of Boston. Condominium law didn't come into effect until 1972, so here we are just a few years later. And I created these modern interiors, curved mm -hmm. walls, right. wood ceilings, right. uh, took the backs of the buildings and made them all glass and balconies and, and created garages with roof gardens on them. So all this, this idea of... Uh, that people now talk about new urbanism. Mm -hmm. This was really pioneering uh, in Boston, but Boston had the historical shell of buildings uh, that would allow me to start thinking about the greater good and the greater context, right. but then how to, how to make buildings uh, work financially. Right, right, right. No, exactly, and, and in fact, um, I mean, I mentioned about entrepreneurialism because um, in, I think in many ways, if you look at your architectural training, the urban design training, and then your sense of business and your sense of really going out into the world and making a new way to practice architecture, I think that's much more pioneering than you probably realize. And, and, and you'd be surprised how many students today are really excited about that kind well, of Well, I think, I think when, when, when I think of an architectural school education, I mean, that, that degree, the Bachelor of Architecture, even if you never practiced architecture, gives you such a strong background of how you see the world. Right. I always say someone with an architectural education sees the world with a different set of eyes. Right. And, and, and how you, 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 you're you sensitized to, to the things that are important about history and scale and form and, and line. But at the same time, there's a cultural aspect to it that an architectural education really gives someone. So I think it's really important. And then when you couple it with uh, a deeper understanding of how the world really works and what you need to understand, you need to understand how to get a loan from a bank. You right. need to understand business. Uh, you need to be able to sell an idea to uh, a historic district commission right, right. or the Boston Redevelopment Authority if it's the Faneuil Hall Marketplace right. or a lender or a bank. So you really need to be a little bit of a showman. And I think the architectural school process of critique and, and doing design studios and standing in front of, of an audience to sell an idea where you're being challenged right. really gives you the primer to really be successful in the business world, even if you never practiced architecture in itself. You know, I, 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 I spend a lot of time uh, talking to parents, uh, giving large talks, uh, recruiting students, and... and really talking to parents about what an architectural education is today, what it provides. We often tell parents, you know, we're the number three ranked school of architecture. You're in really the US. number one, you just don't know it. We're, we're the, our number on the, on the actual design intelligence ranking is three, but, but uh, I will agree one. with we're you. We're number we're, one. We, we, are, we are the best. Um, we always say, um, if your son or daughter is interested in studying architecture, um, the number three school or the number one school is probably a really good place to come and study architecture. Right. But we also say that because an architectural education, because of the, the, com the, the things that are at its core are so fundamental to the kind of things you're talking about, to business, to living and working in the world, that in fact, if your son or daughter wants to be an investment banker or wants to be a developer or wants to run an art gallery, in fact, this is the best model of education. There are two things we do, I think, that really no other curriculum does. They, uh, and those two things were done when you were in school. They're done now, and they'll always be done in architecture. One is everything we do is team-based. Right. Um, students learn as much from each other as they do from any instructor. Sometimes more. Sometimes, very often more. More, because I remember, I mean, because uh, the intensity of the program, I mean, you never leave Slocum Hall. Right. I mean, right. you live and breathe in the studio. Exactly. And and the person sitting next to you for 14 hours a day, and you're sharing ideas. I mean, some of my best friends, you know, 50 years later, are still the people that I met, you know, going into architecture school. Right, right. And, and these are the lasting relationships and friendships because you're in it together, and, you, and you're sharing those ideas. And it's not always about uh, the design critic or your, or your teacher that's going to give you the, the information you really need that's lasting and meaningful. Absolutely. And it's, it's you know, part of that team-based learning is that everything you learn is, therefore, if it's team-based, it's in public. And, in fact, you learn, you learn your lessons and you, and you show those lessons in public. So, so you learn in the studio, um, and when you, when you show your work to the professors, you pin up on the wall. 
and it's a it's a pinup and it's a critique right. and it, and in many ways it's like selling a project That's you right. have to convince a group of five critics that not only is this a decent or a good design this is the best and perhaps only way this could have been done that's right that's right so for example uh, you know in my case uh, I would I would always go to say an upper class studio and I would look at their work and I would say I want to go talk to that student mm. I want to say I want to learn what he or she knows because it's better than than what I can do right now right and so I took that same attitude when I went to work for Ben Thompson or the Architects Collaborative, and I would seek out people that I thought were more talented than I was or could do things far better than I could do and follow them, introduce myself to them, and learn from them. So that whole peer relationship of learning, I think, is, uh, is critical. When I was at the uh, Architects Collaborative, uh, Howard Elkis, who uh, unfortunately passed away recently, um, became my mentor. Mm -hmm. And he saw something that I had done, and he said, come with me, young lad. Right. I have something to work uh, uh, with you on. And, uh, and that mentorship uh, from co-professionals, even to this day, uh, is critically important. And I, uh, in my own practice, I make sure that we all critique the work that everyone's mm -hmm. doing. There's mm -hmm. not one lone ranger off doing their own thing. Right. And in our studio, Everybody has, has an opportunity to participate and critique the work that we're doing. And we always say, you know, design is an ever-patient search for excellence. Mm -hmm. And I don't care where it comes from. It could come from the office guy who's an intern. If he's got a great idea, let's go pin it on the wall. Let's take a look at it. Right. And I think the architecture school process really welcomes and, and, and gives you that, that experience that you can translate much later in life. I want to ask you about something you just alluded to, which is the... Um which is this technique of blowing up the drawings and how that relates, if it relates at all, to something else that you talk quite a lot about in your book and I know is also fundamental to the way that we educate architects, and that is the narrative dimension of the project itself. Yes. Part of it is telling the story and convincing the client, of course. Another aspect of that, however, is the way in which you script out a house design. That's right. Uh, you often talk about it in terms of, 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 of basically writing a movie script, so it could be like a film or a novel. That's right. And part of that is really creating a scenario for the future way in which the client could be living and the life that they could be living right. in this home. Can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, that's well, such a powerful thing. Well, one of the things that's often difficult, you know, when, when, when people come in to talk to me about doing a house, oftentimes... You know, or if it's a husband and wife or, or, or if it's two partners, they each come with a list of things that they want in the house. And oftentimes they're in conflict or they have a multitude of pictures of which could be 20 different design directions. So I oftentimes say, look, we're going to write the novel or the script of your house to be together. So let's start with a storyline, particularly if you're working in a historic district mm -hmm. or there's some reference point. It could be even something, a modern house, but if there's some context in which you can start to say, even if it's made up, um, it helps As your you, house is. My house. Your my own house. house, you house made, my house in Egertown is made I up. I hope you'll tell that story in sure, a minute. I will. Okay. Yeah. I will. So, all right, I'll start now. So, <laughs> so uh, I built a house 15 years ago in Egertown Village on Martha's Vineyard, which is a 300-year-old whaling captain's village. And I had uh, come across an opportunity on a piece of land that someone else had torn down uh, two shacks on and ultimately chose not to build a house. So I was able to buy these two parcels of land. And uh, so what I tell people when I take them through my house today, it it's, uh, was built in 1790 as a midshipman's house. It wasn't a captain's house. And in the early 1820s, uh, that family built a barn at the back of the house. And then in the late 1800s, at the rear of the property, which faces the commercial street to the harbor two blocks away, uh, they built a livery stable. And that uh, for many years the house was rented out and there was a tavern in it and a lot of things happened. But I came across the property and it was totally abandoned and kind of a mess. And I restored the house and brought it all back and I took the tavern room and I restored all the woodwork and the Rumford fireplaces and the barn, kept all the structure. And the livery stable I now reimagined as a carriage house. Mm -hmm. And the space between the livery stable and the barn I made into a, into a swimming pool and a courtyard in this wonderful place. 
And I preserved all the hardwood floors and the fireplaces and the, and the moldings and the trim and the detail uh, and created this barn family room with the big volume that opens up to the outdoor space and so on. And they say, what a wonderful restoration. It's just beautiful. And I just love the way you preserved this, but it lives in a modern way. You opened up the back of the right. house and it's right. indoor outdoor living right. and this wonderful courtyard you created that was basically just a, just the yard where the horses were. Uh, it's just magical, and what a great job. I say, well, thank you very much, but you know what? It's all brand new from scratch. <laughs> Didn't exist. Uh, so that's a good example, and I use that as a way not only to get people to start to understand uh, thematically where we could go, but it also helps as a checks and balance on like what the doorknobs should be, what the hinges right. should be, right. what are the faucets, you know, what's the kind of lighting you want to have. So right. it's a way to always bring it back to, as I say, well, the next chapter in the book. So right. we, I'm like the orchestra conductor, and we're going to write the music together. Right. But that at the end of the day, as we move through the chapters of this novel or the script of this house to be, we have a way to look back and check ourselves because sometimes, you know, you have an interior designer come in with a whole different set of ideas and they may right. want to have some fun over here and right. some fun over there. Right. And, well, I take what I do really seriously, even though I like to have fun with it. Right. But there's a consistency of approach that I think you see in, in, in the book that, that really continues to translate itself to quality architecture that has a true sense of place, that has human scale, and celebrates as what I call the greater good theory. Indeed. This uh, narrative dimension that, that manifests itself uh, in a novel that has chapters, that unfolds, you know, that's, that it's, it's also uh, when you have a longer narrative like that, it's easier to step back from the house itself and place yourself in the context of the neighborhood, yes. the community, because it's a bigger story. It's That's a right. bigger story than your house, right? right. The narrative is, is, it expands out. Right. So I, oftentimes I have to explain to my client uh, when they come in, they spend a lot of money to buy these properties, particularly in historic districts. It's, it's sometimes multiple millions of dollars sure. before you start anything. Uh, that it's not always about you. It's not always about what you want. It's always not about a particular style that you think your house should be. You need to look at the context of what's around you right. in terms and, and, and how is, does it fit. And the space between the buildings become as important as the buildings themselves. And there's also this idea of, of the public realm. Right. And if there are views and vistas that could be shared to a harbor or to a pond or to a, uh, a sunset, that the public could share and still not inf not negatively influence what you're trying to achieve for private outdoor spaces, then you should take that opportunity to create a public realm that is important. And right. we do that in our commercial projects right. about public access to the waterways, um, views and vistas, hidden gardens. You know, in Beacon Hill, we have these wonderful hidden gardens. Uh, how you get a pier of looking down a little alleyway and seeing that hidden garden. Uh, these are important elements of elements of delight that everyone can enjoy, mm -hmm. not just the client themselves. Mm -hmm. So these are important devices that I try to explain in the initial process of why the greater good theory is important. Right. And at the same time, you will be celebrated as the end user of doing the right thing. The paradox is you give up your ego That's and right. you get it back. You get it back because, because you, you've done the right thing and, because and you're the, the right. good guy. Exactly. And you're the good exactly. guy. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there's a, there are a couple of other, I think, things to, ex to explore with that. When I read other people's accounts of your work, and I re have read some in, in your book itself, but also I've seen some testimonials and things, uh, uniformly people are so impressed with the exquisite nature of the detail. Right. Everything is worked out. Right. Every so. So with your, I think with your, with, particularly with the, with the residential work, uh, especially in Edgartown, um, it's not just that this is a beautiful home. It's that every detail is worked out. And there's a larger kind of philosophical living implication of all that, the experience right. of living there. But, and so, and so there's a way in which when you, when, when you, when you 
flip through the pages of the book, you you really enjoy it. You, you feel like vicariously like you're living through those right. poems, which I probably will never get inside yeah, of anyway. Yeah, well, you can, yeah. anytime okay. you want. Uh, well, the, the book is beautiful. So, so I see all those details, and I hear people talk about those things, and I know people know that when they experience and they live in one of the homes and when they're working with you. But interestingly, you've said, and I've heard you say this in a lecture, you've said you feel like your greatest accomplishment as an architect is not any one of those individual details in those homes. It's not any one of those individual homes. It's the larger community of Edgartown it's itself. It's the collective whole. It's so the collective whole. I've had the opportunity over the last 25 plus years to do 177 plus houses in 12 blocks, plus commercial buildings, plus the, the yacht club, plus uh, the fire museum. Uh, plus, we're converting a Carnegie Library to a new visitor center, and I did that pro bono for the town um, about giving back. But it's really like having your uh, American Flyer train set that I had as a kid in real life, where I've done a whole town, and I'm like the ghost in the night. At the end of the day, you never knew I was there, right. but I've really preserved a whole town and really reimagined it in a different way of living, the way people want to live today, right, right. but still in the historical context. So, so in, in a way, you're, you're, the strength of your signature, of your design idiom, is that we don't, is that you it's You never not knew evident. I would, that's right. It's not that's there. Right. I don't have a signature style. You I don't, don't have, have a particular style. window. Or, right. I mean, if, if we look at certain modernists, you'll, you'll know a, a Frank Gehry building, or you'll, you'll know, uh, you know, going back to uh, Paul Rudolph, you know, uh, you know, brutalism. And you know, there's lots of architects that are known for a particular style. Right. Even in residential. Sure. Uh, you know. Jacobson's houses, I, I, he does the same thing all the time. So everybody knows that they're his houses. And I think they're beautiful for what they are. Maybe they don't live so well mm. because they're all white on mm. white and mm. God forbid there's another color in it mm. and it's a problem. But I do love them yes. as an architect. Yeah. I think they're beautiful and they're good scale. Let me ask you this. Um, one drives through neighborhoods, one probably goes to Martha's Vineyard and we see and, and again, this goes back to, the, to, to what I've seen of clients reading the details of your work. They say, I, I, you know, I traveled through Edgartown, I, I went to this house, I went to that one, and there was, this, there was a thread through them all, and there was an incredible attention to detail, there was quality. There was clearly a hand behind those that was sophisticated right. that we can call an architect. Not every house that we see that, that's a beautiful, appearing to be a beautiful historical house is designed by an architect. No. What is, what's the, what, why should I want to hire an architect to well, do a house? Well, here's the difference. Uh, as I say, you know, architects see with a different set of eyes. I mean, a contractor and a builder and a carpenter, they all have you know, their role to play, but it's different. An architect sees with a different set of eyes. And in my houses, some architects really focus purely on the exterior and they don't have the patience to deal with the client on picking out the hinges and, and, and 20 different doorknobs to look at. It requires a different mindset to do high-end residential work to start off with right. because you're really like the marriage counselor and the psychiatrist as much as being the architect. And you have to have a certain patience, but you also have to have a certain conviction. Some people say, I'm a very strong personality. Well, I am to a degree because I want this house to be consistent on the outside as it is the inside. And I'm not willing to have someone else, in quote, have some fun on the interior of mm -hmm. my house. Mm -hmm. So with that comes a commitment and a responsibility to, um, to see it through, right down to all the minutiae of the details. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people see in my work, that there is that consistency of thinking and that consistency of, of uh, appropriateness uh, even though all these houses are all entirely different styles and there's not one style that I, I like more than another, right. um, but there's a scalability about it and there's, and there's a, a sense of place that people feel that these homes are, are livable, they're comfortable, they are sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, do, I, I did a house on Chappaquiddick a few years ago, 860 square feet. Wow. Slightly bigger than the house I grew up in wow. Levittown which was 832 square feet. I'm glad you mentioned Levittown because, yeah. because there's a way in which obviously growing up in Levittown, which is really the, one could say, is the start of suburban development in right. this country, but is, but is also an expression of modernism in a certain kind of that's way. That's right, that's right. 
You say something about that because because you, you obviously you grew up there and that that was you before you came to Syracuse Architecture. That's right. That's right. So Levittown was critically important to me in many many ways. Um, so for those of of people who don't know about Levittown, it was built right after the war, 1946 to 1951, on the potato fields of Long Island. And uh, there were 17,544 of virtually the same house. There were two styles. From 1946 to 1948, there were the Cape Cod style houses, mm -hmm. which are slightly smaller, and then the ranch style houses. And uh, Abe Levitt, the developer who bought up all the potato fields, was really very friendly with Robert Moses, who was laying out the parkway system on Long Island. Right. And much of Levittown was built in and about the parkway system. So uh, there was this com commonality of thinking about green space and open space. So in, Levitt, in Levittown's thinking, um, all these streets were not the grid, which is typical to mm -hmm, New York, mm -hmm. but there were 1,001 lanes. Right. Even though every house had the same floor plan, there were four different facades. And unlike uh, upscale suburban communities that might have the name of the, the Aspen and the Strathmore, they were either one, two, three, or four. So I lived in two number ones. <laughs> uh, slightly different facade. There's a little facadectomy going on, but exactly the same floor plan. And Abe's son uh, was an architect. And he was a uh, someone who really studied Frank Lloyd Wright in the Unisonian houses. Mm -hmm. yes. So we have this modern idea of a floor-to-ceiling window wall of glass in the living room, a two-way open fireplace, radiant heat in the slab. There were no yep. basements. Yep. They had to get a variance from the town of Hempstead to be able to build a house without a basement because prior to that, all houses had to have basements by the building code. Mm -hmm. These were slab on grade, and there was a, uh, a boiler heating system sitting in a metal container next to the fireplace with a washing machine next to it, Youngstown metal kitchen cabinets that were about eight feet long, including the stove, but this wonderful two-way fireplace that created hearth and home, this window wall of glass, and all the streets were curvilinear in nature. Every house came with a weeping willow tree, a crab apple tree, and a little blue stone walkway. And in the 1950 ranch, which is what I had, and I was born in 1950, so I'm the true mm -hmm. Levittowner. Wow, yes. I uh, had the little TV built in underneath the staircase yeah. and a staircase going up to an attic that already had the dormers and windows in place. <laughs> and the heating system was designed to take on another, another zone so that you could easily add two more bedrooms upstairs. The whole house was 832 square feet. The 1949 ranches didn't have a carport. The 1950s did, mm -hmm. uh, which was e easily converted to a, uh, uh, a garage. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the thinking and in the covenants, none of the backyards when I had all these window walls of glass facing other houses were allowed to have fences. So we had this wonderful green space, a play space, not on the streetscape, but through the yards where kids can run around right, and so on. Right. And there were bike paths that were interconnected to village greens. And each village green had a community swimming pool, community shopping, uh, oftentimes the elementary schools. So you, everybody was walking. So we talk about new urbanism and walkability right. to, to centralized uh, community shopping districts with, with natural amenities being the swimming pools right. in this case, or the schools. Um, in the streets, all the utilities were in the back. So all the streets didn't have any telephone poles or electric poles. Right. Right. So we had these wonderful curvilinear sidewalks, <coughs> excuse me, with uh, green space from the road, green space, then sidewalk, then trees in wonderful streetlights. And because all these were built on the potato fields, everything grew really quickly. Right. So by the mid-50s, we had these wonderful canopied streets that were curvilinear in nature. You could walk a bicycle everywhere. And my house cost $6,900. It was $100 down and $66 a month, and you had to be a GI after the war. And since everybody was of the same socioeconomic level, Everybody felt they were they were good. Right. Nobody knew right. that you were like you know maybe lower middle class or or whatever. And one of the other things that Levittown did was Levitt built the schools for free, so he gave back to the community. And in turn, the community hired the best teachers and paid them the most amount of money. So Union Free School District Number Seventeen that I went to had the best teachers and the best schools which really gave me the, uh, the impetus to think about architecture 
as a career because I had really good guidance counselors. Now, what I also know is you know all about that, and you know it in, with such precision and in such detail, not just because you lived it, but because you wrote your thesis on that. That's right. Right. So Syracuse <laughs> gave me that opportunity to talk about Levittown from an architectural and sociological perspective. Right. And I went deep back into the Wayback Machine, into my roots, and I learned about that. Right. And so when I was a kid, and I had the American Flyer train set, I spent more time using shirt cardboard to build my version of the Levittown houses that I would modify. Right. And so many of the Levittown houses that were so creative with, with the Levitts, that whole Unisonian idea of walls that could move. So we had this window wall of floor to ceiling glass that you could move out and like double the size of your living room right. very inexpensively. Right, right. So the, the local magazine, um, the Levittown or, or 1001 Lanes as they referred it to, would come out on a monthly basis and they show all these people adding onto their houses and how to do it. Mm. So I would stu I would down to the library and I would research all these magazines from the past and study how people added on to houses. And then I would do that with my train set. Right. So I had spent more time building my own version of Levittown than running the trains around the track. What strikes me is is reading about and hearing you talk about Edgartown and and, 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 and the whole you know, the holistic nature of the community and having had such an impact over time, over 25 years, 160 projects. In some ways, you have built it's my Levittown. the community spirit and the new way of living that Levittown was pioneering. That's right. In the early, you know, just after the Second World That's War. Right. And I have my 50th high school reunion coming up in a few months. So uh, go visit <laughs> again and see how it's doing. I want to ask you about, uh, uh, so, so we've been talking a lot about design and to some extent about the value uh, that's added by design and the difference between, let's say, architects and others uh, who are engaged in their own practices, but they're not looking at it from a holistic point of view and they're not adding design in the way that architects do. But there are, there are many aspects of what I think you have learned over your career and you've developed over your career um, in terms of Zone, zoning, in terms of historic tax credits, in right. terms of all these seemingly non-exciting aspects of design that are absolutely crucial for success. That's right. And I think, I think that's one of the things that uh, I think Syracuse uh, University and the architecture school uh, really gives students that opportunity to, to take a class in the, in the school, of, school of law, to understand contracts, right. to understand zoning. I mean, as I say to, to my clients, and to the people in my office, zoning dictates design. So for example, in the town of Chilmark uh, on Martha's Vineyard, there's an 18-foot height restriction. And even if they had 20 acres, you can't build more than 3,500 square feet mm -hmm. for a house. They, mm -hmm. they, they're really concerned about the big new house. And, and that community is more rural in nature. And they took it upon themselves to really down zone the area. So uh, I had a client that wanted to build a bigger house. Not huge, but a bigger house. And we had uh, a, a sloping site. And the way you understand it, I understood and read the zoning code, it's about the average mean grade. So I was able to create a three-story house, 6,500 square feet, that met the client's criteria, that met all, all of the zoning in an 18-foot height and 3,500 square feet because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. basements don't count. I right. did a walkout lower level. Right. Uh, as I calculated average mean grade, I was able to, to illustrate to the zoning administrator and the building inspector that, in fact, the average mean grade of the height as the different components stepped down was 18 feet. And so I was able to build a house that satisfied my client's goals and objectives, actually exceeded them, mm -hmm. and created real value in real right. estate. Right. Um, and, and played within the rules, right? but being creative in its thinking. But that's a kind of design creativity in and of itself, and right? And that's what an architectural school education really can help you with. In Boston on Newbury Street, uh, which is the, the, the premier commercial street in Boston today, I looked at those buildings in the early 70s and uh, the upper floors had some apartments in them. The lower level was the basement, which had some windows three or four feet high, and there was a first floor. And I said, well, if we, and all these buildings step back 20 feet from the sidewalk. So if we carve down the sidewalk, we could create two first floors of which you could get rent for two first floors mm -hmm. that could then support 
the renovation of the entire building. Right. Because these buildings were all falling down. Right, right. So I created a business model right. that made sense, but not only did it make sense as a business model, but it also made sense of how to animate a streetscape. Right. And how to create sidewalk cafes and restaurants and things like and that. And that's greater good. That's all part of the greater good. Now yeah. this becomes one of the most iconic streetscapes uh, in the United States of mixed use mm -hmm. of retail mm -hmm. and restaurants and apartments and offices all sharing a streetscape where the car is still invited in. Right. So right. the idea of new urbanism, you know, was something I was developing and playing with before it even came into vogue. Right. Right. Um, so uh, zoning is. Uh, a, not a very sexy or exciting topic, but in fact, when you get into the meat and, uh, of zoning and you, you understand it, in fact, there's real possibility for creativity there. What about, and you, and, and you alluded to business as well, you, um, I, I, I know you've done some teaching, I know you do, are on reviews at a lot of right. uh, schools, you come to our reviews, you're, you're obviously on uh, the board of trustees at Syracuse University and you're, you're a very valued member on our board of advisors. You get a lot of CVs. You have people working for you. What do you What do you see now? Um, when 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 students send you their CVs, and when you talk with students, and when you go and you see reviews, what kind of things do you think we're doing right, and what kind of things do we need to change and to do better on? Right. Well, I think in uh, education. I think in general, um, so many for so many years, because it's a professional degree, there are certain criteria of courses that you have to that you have to have to keep your accreditation uh, and be able to get licensed uh, to practice architecture. Right. So that structure within itself limits on how many electives you can take in any given, given semester. But I think um, the more courses that people can take in real estate development, mm -hmm. in business law, mm -hmm. contracts, um, unfortunately, most architects in our profession are not financially successful the way they should based on their education and, and, and responsibility. It's not for lack of skill, it's not for lack of talent, it's not for it's lack just, of creativity. It's just a lot of people uh, are just not good, good business, business people. You right. really need to know how to run a business. I tell people I happen to be a really good business person that is an architect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can speak the language of business. I know zoning. I know contract law. I'm a better lawyer than most lawyers mm -hmm. in real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I present well. Uh, selling an idea to a historic district or a zoning board of appeals is critically important. For you to be able to maximize a real estate investment for a developer and, and have that underlying creativity to get the extra floor right. because you're giving something else back. Right. Um, to be able to offer uh, a creative way of thinking of adding adding a basement that created no income to now getting you know hundred dollars a square foot or three hundred dollars a square foot and that today. wasn't in the brief that, that wasn't in given. the brief so right. so you come across that so for example uh, on a lot of the buildings in the back bay I would I would tell a client look if I get you a garage in the basement of this building that's going to make the value of these condominiums at least five hundred dollars a square foot more mm -hmm. and I tell you what I'll I'll, I'll take a chance on my fee, but I'll get a, a bonus or I'll increase the bonus if I get you the garages or the extra floor. Right. And he has nothing to lose, so let's go for it. Right. And if I'm successful, then you're going to be more than successful. Right. But at the same time, I'm responding to the marketplace, understanding what the market's looking for, but still being respectful of the historical, historical nature of the project mm -hmm. or, or, the, or the context of the neighborhood. And... Uh, and I did that. I've did over 400 buildings in the Back Bay in 45 years. You know what's interesting about, especially about the the project where you, you're describing, in the brief, um, they're not suggesting this basement, and you 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 actually make the suggestion that they do. Um, because I think, as I tell my clients, I think if your money is my money, right? And how would I invest it? And having had the benefit in the early 70s of actually buying buildings and being the developer and the architect. Uh, I learned the hard way, right? Because you know it was my signature, not that I had so much money, right? But it, it was my reputation on the line, and I had to be successful. But you, but but in that example, you give you you give an example of the classic Peter Drucker definition, right. 
uh, with the distinction between problem solving and innovation. If you come to me as a client with a problem and I simply deliver you an answer to that problem, no basement, then I haven't added a lot of value That's and I'm right. not worth a lot. That's right. But if you come to me with this problem and I take the knowledge and experience that I've developed over years by being involved with zoning, real estate, and these other, the whole variety of other things, and I say, you know what? You're asking the wrong question. You need to put a basement in there. I've now added something to your problem, and that's value, and, and for that, I should be compensated. And at the same time, if, if, if you have an architecture degree and you choose not to be an architect, but say you choose to be involved in real estate development, I have four clients that have architecture degrees that, that have never practiced architecture, right. but, they, but they're involved in real estate development. But we can share the language. I was on the phone for an hour and a half today for a, a new project in Cohasset on the waterfront, mm -hmm. which will totally revitalize that town, this sleepy little wonderful seaside cottage town. Mm -hmm. And there's this abandoned project that's that was a motel type project that's miserable and it's it's a blight on the community. And we're going to bring in new residential, you know, uh, condominiums, uh, retail, extending the Main Street experience, marina, but in the architectural vernacular of that town. Mm -hmm. And it'll become this iconic jewel box that everyone in the town can celebrate and be part of. And the developer went to didn't go to Syracuse. He went to RISD, unfortunately. Wow. So he doesn't speak not as clearly as we do. Can go to but but nevertheless, we spent an hour and a half on this collective vision and idea, right. and we're on the same page. Right. And he's interviewing other architects. Right. And he said, "You and I are thinking exactly the like." You know what's interesting, Patrick? You you talk about the language of real estate. What's what's so compelling for me about that is to see how that aligns with the interest of so many of our students today. You know, um, 10 or 15 years ago, if you had asked students at our school or at many schools, um, what do you think about real estate development? They would almost to a student say, that's too much about the marketplace. That's too much about business. That's too much about money. We're not, we're architects. We're not about that. What's interesting, and, and, and they said that out of a kind of an idealism. They wanted to keep architecture pure, right? right? Um, well, in, in my time, people would say architecture is a rich man's hobby and a poor man's profession. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's garbage. You proved that wrong. Right. <laughs> so, so, um, but what's interesting is we have students today who are as idealistic. We're, we're sitting on the 50th anniversary of of, of 1968 when right. so many s activist students around the world. I was there. You, that I know. Was my I time. know. I know. I'm saying that's your time. Power we, to the people. <laughs> we have students today who are just as idealistic about the world that they live in. They're very interested in the environment. They're very interested in using sustainable materials. They're very interested in new ways of working and living. They're very interested in living in smaller places and more, and they're interested in equity and all kinds of things. But what they are also, in a way, I think that students were 10 or 15 years ago, they're very pragmatic. So uh, if you ask many of our students today, and we have a lot, I would say the largest minor in the school is real estate development. That's great. And we're about to start a new real estate uh, program at the Fisher Center in New York. next year in New York City. Um, but when, when, you, when you ask those students now, what, this, what they say is this, they want to change the world and intervene in the world and, and change buildings and neighborhoods and cities just as much as people did in 68. But what, they, what they'll tell you now about real estate is they will say, you know, because I want to do that, I know I have to know the language of business. That's right. And I know I have to know the language of real estate. Exactly. And now, finally, they, they, I think they see because that Because otherwise, way. your voice at the table will not be heard. Exactly. So exactly. you need to be able to sit there in that boardroom or in that conference room with the banker and the redevelopment authority or the planning board. And you need to be able to be the good listener, speak the language of what the concerns are, understand the zoning law, Think how creatively how to better it if you can for your clients, right? And also be able to support it. Exactly. Exactly. And and if you do that, you're going to earn more money. You're going to be respected more for the profession that you're in as an architect because you're representing the profession too. And you're going to give you know, back to the profession, right. and you're going to enhance the reputation. That's of the right. Profession. You're not a drafts person. Right. You're there, and and your talent and your creativity will be respected, and you'll be the one person in the team that people are going to go to and say. 
he knows what we're talking about or she knows what we're talking about and and that person's going to make the difference on this project and it's going to enhance all of our lives you know the only the only thing i well i have one thing to say to that and it's it's the last question i want to ask uh, today we've had a terrific conversation and that question is will you come uh, this next year yes. and deliver that message to our students and give a public lecture and we'll have this conversation with the students. To be continued. Oh, to be continued. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Okay.